Thank you so much for having us here today. We've had a really wonderful time. <laughs> now, here at Wisconsin, we never say goodbye, only that we'll see you real soon and on Wisconsin. <laughs> Have a great conference. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to have you rise once again and welcome our Wisconsin 4-H members, Bridget Howard, Nate Howard, Eli L Lee, Philly Ruth, Thomas Ruth, and Charlotte Tompkins, who are going to post the colors and lead the pledges. Color guard advance. Color guard, halt. Attention. Color guard, salute. Will the audience please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance immediately followed by the 4-H Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Color Guard, retreat. Will you join me? Thank you. Thank you to the Dane County 4-H members. Will you join me in singing the national anthem? 
Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we've hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous night o'er the ramparts we've watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the All right, thank you, thank you, thank you. And welcome to Madison, Wisconsin. As I said to most of you, I've been waiting three years to say that to you. And I'm thrilled that this day has finally arrived. We have a fabulous few days planned for you um, with some innovative professional development opportunities, some collaborative networking plans, and a lot of fun and a lot of laughter, laughter sprinkled in between. Please note that the Monona Terrace Community and Convention Center and the UW-Madison campus occupy ancestral Ho-Chunk land a place that their nation calls Dejope, since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly, but unsuccessfully, sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. We acknowledge the circumstances that led to the forced removal of the Ho-Chunk people and honor their legacy of resistance and resilience. This history of colonization informs our work and vision for a collaborative future. We recognize and respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation and the other 11 Native nations within the boundaries of the state of Wisconsin. Along, thank you, along the lines of gratitude, I want to say a very special thank you to some very special colleagues from Wisconsin who have taken leadership over the past three years to pull together this awesome, awesome opportunity for you all. I'd like to have these folks please stand and give a wave so that we can see you and thank you properly uh, today and throughout the conference. Co-chairs of the Marketing and Outreach Committee, Dawn Vandevoort and Neil Clemmy. That one here and here. Co-chairs of the Member Services Committee, Penny Tank and Rachel Hart Brinson. Rachel's in England and Penny's probably busy upstairs, so please, when you see them, give them thanks. Co-chairs of the committee with many names, but started as the professional development and ended as kind of a welcome to the great state of Wisconsin committee, Meg Sage and Andrea Ripley. And co-chairs of the opening program committee, Holly Larson and Marie Witzel. Of course, I want to thank uh, Sean Thede, who's standing here next to me, who's been our rock and our uh, super practical, but maybe not as fun co-chair for this conference. <laughs> uh, 
I told them if they gave me the mic again, I could say anything. So uh, <laughs> the thing I do want to say is thank you to Wisconsin for hosting us this week and to Sarah for uh, serving as the co-chair for this year's conference. And she's a singer. Who, who knew that? So welcome. That was, a, and, yeah. that was a pinch hit. One of our 4 hers was sick. So you, you just got me. That's all you got. Uh, but finally, thank you. Thank you for choosing to be present with us this week. And I really want to encourage you to continue to choose to be present with us throughout the conference as you join colleagues throughout the nation who truly understand what it is you do, what motivates you, and what keeps you doing it. Without further ado, let's move on with our program and let's move forward together. That's it, that's all I got to say. Marie Witzel will now come to the stage as the North Central Regional Director and Chair of today's meeting. I have friends. Good morning, I'm Marie Witzel from Wisconsin and happy to chair this morning's session. On behalf of NAE 4-H YDP Board of Trustees, my colleagues at the University of Wisconsin Extension, along with Wisconsin Association Extension 4-H professionals, are excited to host this conference. We hope you enjoy this week. Please give a huge shout out to the conference team and their efforts that the, as they created the 76 NAE 4-H YDP. This is my favorite part because I claim I have a handler. So if you have announcements that you'd like me to make this morning during the, during the end of our meeting, you have to give them to Sean. And Sean will give them to me. So make sure you work the announcements through Sean. You've all seen what he looks like and he's up in the front. Announcements are the items for the majority. It's some, if you have something state specific, those should be on the bulletin board located outside of registration. At this time, I'd like to introduce President Scott Nash from the Idaho to open our business meeting. Thank you, Marie. Isn't it great to be in Madison? I feel like we should dismiss and go to a football game. Because those of us from Idaho, we don't have real college football. So I live out my college football dreams through you all, the Big Ten, the SEC. You know, that's, that's all my friends talk about that football. So and my program leaders back in the back tell me to shut up. So anyway. Um, so I, I thought last year we had a great conference in Madison. I appreciate that group for, for doing that. And, you know, my favorite part of, of the conference is the invite at the, end of the, at the end of our meeting. So I've been looking forward to being in Madison for 11 months. And, and just a few things about Madison. You need to make sure you take a walk. Take a walk along both of the lakes. But if you head across campus, they have really, really good ice cream. And those that know me know I'm an ice, I'm an ice cream guy. So that's what we do. Anyway, um, I guess I have to call this meeting to order. But first of all, I just want to make sure that you all enjoy being here. Take time to reconnect and refresh and just enjoy being here with each other because that's why we're here, right? I hate speaking to a big group like this because you guys are a long ways away back in the back, right? And you're there and you're probably there for a reason. <laughs> but, but thanks for being here. So um, I'll now call the order, call the order the 76th meeting of NAE 4HYDP and I have to use this gavel. So. So I'd like to recognize Chad Proudfoot from Virginia. He's the parliamentarian, the chair of uh, policy and resolutions. He'll be t making sure we stay on business throughout the time we're here. If, if anybody has a, any item of uh, business to bring, you may bring forward, you may request that by doing the following. I'm going to read these things. Please step to one of the microphones in the aisle. Clearly address the chair. Wait for acknowledgment. Speak your name and state your business or comment. So at this time, is there any unfinished business? 
Chad, I recognize Chad. Chad, Chad pop up. We have a motion on the floor to have the board. Motion made by Chad Proffitt, seconded by Janine Sutter from South Carolina. All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Motion carried. Is there any other unfinished business? Seeing none, I'd like to recognize and appreciate uh, our guests. You know, there are so many influential, important people that we work with that support our program. Um, please help me thank them for what they do and the support they give us to make our program successful and provide resources so that we can do what we do each day. Uh, as I acknowledge individuals, will you please stand? And we're going we're gonna to try to hold our applause till the end, but I know how we are. We'll applaud when we want to. So, <laughs> so, so please stand and be recognized. So all the extension deans in the room, please stand. We have, a, we have a couple. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Extension directors, please stand. We see a few. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> State 4-H program leaders, and I know there's a lot of you out. At least there were a lot of you here yesterday. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other administrators from our universities that are out there? Please stand if you haven't recognized yet. Nice. USDA NIFA staff, I know we have some USDA NIFA staff here. Please stand and let us recognize you. And National 4-H Council, I know that we have some National 4-H Council folks here. Thank you for being here. Great, that's a great team. Lastly, any sponsors and other guests who've joined our conference, we want to thank them for their support and encouragement. Can you please stand if you're a sponsor or other invited guest? Thank you. And now, you know, we have this script that's been mapped out for three days. We're going to deviate from the script. My favorite thing to do is deviate from the script. <laughs> and Sally's back. Sally's sitting down there gasping like this. Anyway. So we, uh, we're, we're grateful to have the dean of the College of Ag at Extension, sorry. In, in our, in our part, sorry, that's the College of Ag, dean of Extension. But what I want to say about the dean is when we were doing the 4-H pledge, he actually knew it. I don't know that. I don't know that my dean would know that. So I'm glad to have that. So, so we're, we're grateful to have our colleagues at the University of Wisconsin be here for their support and participation in hosting this conference. I'd like to welcome Dr. Carl Martin, Dean and Director of Extension here at the University of Minnesota, Wisconsin, to the podium. Dr. Martin was a forest research scientist and also chief of the Wildlife and Forest Research Program with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. He was an assistant dean and state program lead for the Community Natural Resources and Economic Development Program with an extension. He has been dean and director of extension since 2016, overseeing an administrative restructuring and a transition of operations to UW Madison campus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Madison. In case you didn't figure it out from the band, you're in Wisconsin. <laughs> um, to those of you who are joining us from across the nation, I want to extend uh, a heartfelt welcome to Madison, and in particular to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Despite the cool fall coming our way, I know that you'll receive the warmest of receptions that the Midwest is known for, especially from our colleagues in the Wisconsin who have been preparing for your visit for quite some time. And I want to Again, thank Sarah Targison and the team here in Wisconsin. They've done an amazing job pulling this together. Let's give them another round of applause. So the weather outside, this is typical weather for Wisconsin year round. Um, so I, I really encourage you to get out, um, enjoy the square, which is the, the streets around the Capitol. If you're here on Saturday, there's a wonderful farmer's market. I do believe it's the largest open air farmer's market in the US. Um, and I also uh, would really encourage you to take that walk down State Street. Campus is a relatively short, short distance away. Um, and campus is uh, bustling. Um, I just saw the numbers yesterday. There's 49,000 students on campus. So it, it's a busy place. 
in the f years following 1914, um, and 4-H you know, was really critical um, for providing the latest skills and knowledge to the people of Wisconsin. Today, our 4-H staff and members are still part of the mission to transfer skills and knowledge to their communities. In 1851, the state of Wisconsin adopted the simple word forward as its state motto. It's a powerful word that has symbolized the state's history and innovation. Forward reflects Wisconsin's drive to be a national leader. Um, and I think that's true for 4-H when it comes to youth development and youth programming. And I thank you all for your work in that area. Innovation and creativity are also reflected at the heart of our youth programming and how we continue to meet the needs of our communities. The theme for your conference, Forward Together, couples innovation along with knowledgeable, caring teams of people to develop a cornerstone of thriving youth and communities. I was excited to see the schedule of your program over the next few days and how it reflects the priorities and impacts we have here in Wisconsin. Youth and colleagues continue to lead the way in innovation by leading the nation in practice of research and youth development, including the evaluation of the thriving model of youth development, inspiring science and engineering careers, modeling a virtual learning community, increasing the understanding and development of extension professionals, embracing the utilization of restor restorative practices with youth, and so much more. Our 4-H program here in Wisconsin uses the 4-H thriving model to help program leadership monitor program quality on an ongoing basis. Interestingly, our annual evaluation confirms that Dr. Arnold's original study on thriving, as program quality increases, so do youth outcomes. We also provide key mental health opportunities for youth through our 4-H programming. The thriving model shows that more than 90% of the members surveyed have had the opportunity to build supportive relationships with adults and their peers. During the pandemic, youth reported that 4-H was an important place to receive support and to offer support to other youth who were struggling. Even when programs are virtual, we know the positive youth development outcomes of 4-H are addressing the mental health challenges facing our youth today. We also learned that 4-H is a pathway to higher education and careers, especially in agriculture and animal sciences. Again, more than 90% of our youth who responded to surveys said that their time in 4-H helped them understand what career field they would pursue. I encourage you to learn from our colleagues in Wisconsin as well as each other as you explore the way forward together. And I want to appreciate the work you do every day to create positive opportunities for youth all across the nation. Often behind the scenes, it makes a huge difference in our communities and our future, and I thank you for that. One quick story I want to share. Um, so I'm the youngest of 11 children, and I grew up on a dairy farm in central Wisconsin. And my family was, was quite poor growing up, and we have very few photos, uh, particularly of my older siblings. I'm the youngest of 11. There's a large gap. Um, and there's one particular photo that's cherished by everyone in my family. It's a photo of my eight oldest siblings. Um, it's from 60 years ago, actually. It's a, obviously a black and white photo. And it's them standing near a 4-H cow, a 4-H heifer, actually, a brown Swiss heifer that um, they had prepared for the fair. Um, and just the, the partnership amongst the siblings, the pride in that heifer shows through in this old photo that all my siblings and I now have digitally um, and we value uh, as part of our family history. And I think that really shows uh, the importance of 4-H, importance of 4-H to families, the importance of 4-H um, to, to the history uh, of a lot of our families and families that we work with and new families that we'll be working with moving forward. And I really um, want to express my sincere appreciation to everyone here for all you do to make uh, such important opportunities available to our youth. So welcome again to the great state of Wisconsin, and thank you for this opportunity to get this important professional development conference underway. Let's have a great week, and let's have some fun. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for your welcome and your remarks, and more importantly, for your support of UW folks to be able to allow, allow us to be here and have this conference, so thank you for that. Now I gotta get back to this, the scripts that I provided, so I make sure I'm on, on task. So as an any 4-H YDP, mem YDP member, you are uh, joined this association by 3,006 active members, 
1,005 live members, four student and 21 affiliate members. Um, business is conducted on, on your behalf by the Board of Trustees. It meets regularly. Um, they were elected by you. I'd like the members of the Board of Trustees to stand at this time. I told this group the other night how much I appreciated what they do, and, and they do a lot behind the scenes that, that you all won't even get, get to know about that they, they do. So they not only work their day jobs, but they spend a lot of time on your behalf to make sure that we as an association have a lot of professional development opportunities for you. And just, just if you see them, thank them and let them know how much you appreciate them. You'll hear more about their impact and accomplishments throughout the conference. I also want to recognize their administrators and thank them for the support they provide. You know, without the administrators signing off on being on the board, you, you, don't be, you can't be on the board. So we appreciate the administrators for their support and all they do for that. So please recognize them and thank them for that. So I'm pleased to introduce the following individuals who were recently elected in accordance with our bylaws by using electronic voting process. And so the new uh, members of the board would just please stand and recognize them in the, in the audience. Is that right? Is that right, Sally? Thank you. So. Ben Pullen from Iowa, the new North Central Region Director. And you can, rec you can recognize Ben, he has a nice full beard that I could never have. <laughs> Jamie Mullins from West Virginia, Northeast Region Director. Thank you. April Edwards from Georgia, a new Southern Region Director. Marlena Greasy from Colorado, West Region Director. Heather Janney from Florida, Vice President of Development and Education. <laughs> Sally McClaskey from Iowa, the new Vice President of Conferences and Events. Or Iowa, sorry, Ohio, oh my gosh. <laughs> from The Ohio State University, I'll never live that down, will I? <laughs> oh my gosh. I think Debbie Nisser kind of got freaked out for a minute, right? <laughs> and Bernie Wiesen from New York, our President-elect. Congratulations and thank you to all of our new elected board members for accepting this, this uh, challenge to be on the board. I also want to thank our organizational stewardship committee members led by Suzanne Bortz for your work in identifying and recruiting some excellent new candidates to serve on the board. Of, on the board. It's important to share, your work, to share the work that the Board of Trustees has done over the past year. So at this time, I'm going to recognize three of our board members that serve as VPs. They're going to share highlights over the last year and the updates of the team. So, I'm going to call Alyssa Walden, our, our VP of Programs, to the stage. I'm not quite as tall as Scott, so I've got to adjust the microphone here. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alyssa Walden, and I am from Virginia, and it has been a pleasure to serve as your Vice President of Programs for the last three years. I am your final VP of Programs, so I take that as a huge honor to have served in that role. Out the clicker. So as the VP of programs, I oversee 14 different working groups, and you can see those listed on the screen there, and I think you would agree with me that it represents a variety of interests and topic areas. So if you are a leader for one of these groups, will you please stand to be recognized for the outstanding work you do throughout the year? You'll have an opportunity to hear more from our working groups later today and on Thursday, but I wanted to spend some time highlighting some of the work of the groups so that you get a better sense of what they do throughout the year to help serve our organization. I wish I could recognize every single working group, so I will be sending out a PowerPoint deck after conference that gives you highlights from all of the groups if you want to get involved. Um, but I'd first like to highlight our Ag Literacy Working Group. Um, and one of the big things they did this year was host a lunch and learn series. They had six different lightning talks with subjects like innovating ideas, engaging youth through virtual agriculture resources, and camp in a box. Our civic engagement working group will be hosting a global luncheon during the conference, so I hope if you signed up for that, you will check that out. And they also hosted many webinars throughout the year, including 4-H Backpack Adventure. 
if you were here yesterday and participated in the pre-conference workshop for communication and expressive arts, will you just wave your hand around? Awesome. So communication and expressive arts took advantage of pre-conference workshops to bring you more communication and expressive arts programming. And they also created a social media toolkit for your use. Yesterday, when we were meeting as leaders, our STEM group got a lot of flack for submitting a couple of extra slides. But they've done a lot of great work, so we want to recognize them. You have probably seen the STEM newsletter in your inbox at some point throughout the year. And this group boasts over 300 members, which is pretty good numbers for our association. They've also been conducting a lesson study over the last couple of years and presenting that during the conference this week. So please attend that session. So now it's your turn to get involved with the great work of our association. There's a little over a thousand of you here in the room today and we have 14 programs working groups. So if you all go to one meeting, those rooms will be full and we'll have a great success in getting our working groups productive throughout the year. Those meetings will take place today from four to six, and you can look in the conference app for the meeting locations. And then finally, if you are on a member and you have an online profile, you can sign up to receive group updates through social link. And if you need help doing that, just come see me and I'll make sure you get connected. Thank you. So as I listened to the literature, she's the final VP of programs. As you know, we restructure our governance uh, structure, and uh, Alyssa's term ended, but we appointed her to serve one more year. It was easier to have her finish that role and instead of have someone else new trained to be in that role. But I appreciate Alyssa for making the transition to the new chair of education to be pretty much smooth and seamless. At this time, I'm going to wel welcome Steve McKinley, our VP for Professional Development from Indiana to the stage. Thank you, Scott, and specifically from Purdue University in Indiana. That's important, so we need to make sure we know that too, right? But it is a pleasure to be with you this morning, and it's been a pleasure to serve as your VP, VP for professional development over the last couple of years. I think we've accomplished a lot in that time, and that's thanks to you, the membership, all the different opportunities that you've provided to our profession to be able to offer some development opportunities in a number of areas. And so here's my clicker. I need to find that right. Oh. Does this work? Look at that. That is cool. All right, so here are our teams. We have not as many teams as the programs area, but we do have a number of teams that work together to offer those opportunities for you. Those include creating a healthier you, the research and evaluation, teaching and learning, virtual professional development, and volunteerism. Uh, some of our team members, Elijah Wilson has been the chair of the research and evaluation the last couple of years from Kentucky. Elijah, where are you, sir? You're somewhere in here, you're waving your hand, I'm sure I just don't see you right now. But anyway, we appreciate Elijah's work. Also in entering her second year will be Jamie Morris as the Chair of Professional Development. She is from the University of Maryland. And then we have a number of working group chairs, co-chairs, chair elects. If you are one of those from one of these teams, please stand and be recognized. We certainly appreciate all the work that you are doing and have done over the last couple of years. So thank you very much. Just share a few highlights from our overall professional development. Uh, we are ones that help to work with the conference proposal submissions uh, for both the presentations as well as the poster sessions. And this year had an opportunity to review those and to select those that will be presented here over the next few days. And 34% acceptance rate this year for those presentations. We continue to work to incorporate the results from the professional research, knowledge, and competency needs assessment that Matt conducted for us from Florida uh, last couple of years, and those uh, continue to help drive the presentations that we are putting together and the resources that we, we are putting together. The Journal of Youth Development has had a very productive year in that they have a new publisher, Barry Garst, as well as a new um, publisher at the University of Clemson, and so we're excited to be able to have that opportunities moving forward. We've also established a good working relationship with the Professional Development Program Leader Working Group, and that is uh, giving us the opportunities to be able to look at those PRKC resources, to be able to house them on a web page, and to be able to vet those resources for all of our use. So we'll all have an opportunity 
over the next couple of years to be able to populate that web page and be looking for more information after the first of the year for that. We also work with the Extension Leadership Conference that's sponsored by JSEP. That's coming up next uh, February, the 3rd through the, I'm sorry, the 7th through the 9th. And those uh, proposals are still open. We're still looking for good presentation topics. So through November 1st, if you have a, a topic that you would like to present, we would encourage you to do that. We work to update the NA4H YDP handbook to reflect some of the changes in the structure with the VPs. And so that is up on the, on the website now for you to look at. And then we have professional development opportunities year round. And that's, I think, is one of the better parts of our association is we have a chance to be able to, to present those as we go throughout the year. Wellness Challenge is offered by our Creating a Healthier You Working Group. We're excited about that. Take a look at, at their website, their information. That's something that you can do here at the conference. And we're excited to be able to offer that and thank the Creating a Healthier You Working Group for putting that together. The Teaching and Learning Group has done a number of things this year. They are working closely with the Professional Development PLWG Group on these PRKC resources. They've met together. We'll continue to meet together this afternoon as well, and so we're very thankful for them. They also put together a facilitation training for communities of practice uh, this past winter, and so we are very thankful to that group for all that they have done. And similar to what Sally mentioned, I'm sorry, to what Alyssa mentioned, wrong person. You know, you're, Sally, you're going to get somewhere today. Alyssa, what she mentioned, ways that you can participate as well. There are opportunities for you to submit uh, professional development opportunities year-round. And so if you go to our website, look at the Participate tab, search around there, you can find opportunities to submit a proposal, and that will allow you to present information that you have done, programs that you have done to the membership at any time throughout the year. It doesn't just have to be limited to our conference. And that, again, is something I think is one of the values of our professional association that we have to, to work with. I'll reiterate what Alyssa said. Our groups will be meeting as well from 4 to 6 p.m. this afternoon and evening uh, to talk about the next year's plan of work, what that's going to look like. So I would encourage each of you to find one of those topics, either in programs or in professional development. Uh, check it out. And if you get to one and think you want to switch to another one, that's okay too. But we are looking for additional individuals who are willing to serve and willing to help. So with that, thank you. It's been a pleasure and a best wishes to Heather as she and the team move forward. Thank you. I want to thank Steve for his work the last, over the last two years. We've had over 100 professional development opportunities online and in person. We don't just do them at conference, we do them online throughout the year. So thanks for Steve and his team for making that happen. Next, I'm going to call the State Relations Chair, Megan Brittingham from Wyoming to the stage to share her report. Megan. Imagine that. Awkward. We were talking. Imagine that. No, no. I was afraid of that, though, Scott. I was afraid that Scott, um, nobody could see me over the high thing. Good morning, everyone. Hey, Kim, I think they all need some more coffee. Yeah, let's try that again. Good morning, everyone. Oh, okay, okay. Do you see my slides yet? Yes. Okay. So I am Megan Brittingham, and I'm excited to share some news from the regional directors. I, um, these are highlights because we also do a lot. Um, okay, I'm not going to say that yet. Okay. So before we get into some of our highlights, though, you do need to know who I'm referencing. So from our, in our next slide, you will see photos. There you go, of your regional directors. So from the Northeast region, you can cheer for these people. Do better for them. From the Northeast region, Brenda Pruitt from West Virginia. <laughs> Jen Dykert from Pennsylvania. The North Central region, of course, you've already met Marie Witzel from here from Wisconsin. And Indiana slash Purdue, Kathleen Bodie. The Southern Region has three RDs, Jeffrey Burke from Georgia, Tara Brent, oh, South, come on, Tara Brent from Virginia, 
and Andy Tolley from Florida. Woohoo! And finally, from the Western region, um, it was myself and my friend Marcella Talamente from New Mexico. So give it up for the Western region, please. Next slide, you will see that we serve as the communication link um, from the National Board and our membership. That's you. So if you're sitting in this room, you need to know this table of people because they really do take what you tell them and we do stuff about it, right? Right. Okay. Uh, this year we had three goals that were pretty simple. Invest in people. That's still you, our membership. Invest in process by providing intentional and meaningful networking opportunities to you, the membership. And finally, we invest in the future by helping you, the membership, recognize the value of our association. In our next slide, we can start to take a look at what 2022 looked like for us. But I need to warn you so you can prepare yourself for this mentally. I'm going to call you out on some things. And you may need your phone here in a second. But in the meantime, just be ready that I'm going to make you do stuff, OK? So. Let me check my slides. OK, so in the next slide, I'm going to ask you if you hosted a state regional director if, in your state meeting, sorry, if you hosted a regional director in your state, whether in person or virtually, can you like wave your hands like we did this morning with the band? Yay! OK, so that means. Um, that you are part of the 900 association members who got to talk with the regional director through a state visit, 900. And you don't know how many folks are in our association yet, so you'll be impressed with me too. Um, so we visited 900 members in 20 different states, conducted both virtually and in person. Our topics ranged from introducing the national board and the structure, opportunities, the Thrive Model training, and the QPR gatekeeper training that some did yesterday, too. In the next slide, if you are a member of this, your state association leadership team, if you're an officer of your state association, can you please raise your hands? Smaller group, but still exciting, OK? Um, if you, um, we hosted regional leadership Zooms, um, at least quarterly, like the southern region, or bi-monthly, like the northeast and the south and the west. And so through those, we were able to touch base about 20 times with our state association representatives, and um, that's about 220 members that participated. So congratulations to you guys, because you did a Zoom with us, and it, hopefully it wasn't too bad. Gosh, tough room this morning, you guys. Uh, the next slide. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I do have to say, for those that who like to do math with me, um, these two combined, these two things that we've already talked about, engaged just over 1,000 folks from 37 states, which is pretty remarkable considering our post-COVID time. Um, I can't imagine a more beautiful thing, and we're not done yet. So you may, at this time, now want to get your camera ready for the QR codes. So on this slide, you'll see that Andy Tolley revamped the Pulse newsletter this year. This is our membership newsletter. And this includes quick video interviews with members of the board and also member articles and discussions from you all. Um, the Pulse is released monthly. And so far, the YouTube videos of, his, of Andy's interviews have about 850 views. And I do want to remind you that anyone, including you, can submit articles to the Pulse. On the next slide, I will brag about the Western Regional Directors for a minute. We developed and released a professional development podcast. And we're pretty proud to say that we've reached about 610 members. And it's now available on wherever you get your uh, podcasts, excuse me, and on YouTube. So if you need to, uh, to do that, you can do that too. And on the next slide, but wait, there's more. We also support state association leadership teams by offering orientations and sessions. So in February, oh, sorry, next slide. In February, we visited um, with each, our state association leadership on a Zoom. Um, if you were among us 
who joined that Zoom, cheer like you mean it, you guys. We are fading fast here. Okay. Well, there were about 75 of you that did that. Next. Uh, oh, but wait. Sorry. Next, I have to t remind you that this afternoon at approximately 2.30, we're going to do that session again. So if you are a state officer currently or you have been elected into a state officer position, the regional directors are hosting a session called Strengthening Your State Association. It's at 2.30. It'll be great. Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> Next slide is we went to the JSEP Extension Leadership Conference and we really had a ball of a time discussing our strategic plan, getting your feedback, and then I promise you we did take it back and do stuff about it. For many of our regional directors, that was the highlight of our time is getting to connect with you on a strategic plan. We got ideas on what we can do better and we've got some ideas on what we can also um, share with others on the board. And our favorite part, of course, was our association dinner that we organized and we had some wonderful meals and we had some intentional hospitality there or networking that night. Also, right, Jeffrey? In the lobby. On the next slide. During that session, we did share um, with state uh, associations the handbook that I updated because that's what we do and you can access it using a QR code next slide oh there's the QR code if you need to take a photo of that one to access that next one okay <sighs> finally if you attended last night's Monday Night Live, you have to cheer now. Thank you, thank you. Um, next slide, pointing. So one of the things, we had a wonderful casual networking event for everyone to socialize and hopefully meet some new people. Um, we were very hopeful to be able to share these with you last night. But they've arrived today, and so we did uh, challenge the board of directors to engage with our membership by distributing pins. They arrived today, so our regional directors are spreading those around the room for you. Um, if you don't get one today, catch up to us, and we'll make sure you do get them. I have to tell you my final thought is that um, on the way over to the um, reception last night, someone, the person I was walking with said, oh, I didn't know that we could go to that because I thought it was just for special people. And I'm here to tell you that you are the special people. So thank you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll talk to you later. I want to thank Megan and her team for the outstanding job they did. If you can't tell, the board, of the regional directors bring life and, and energy to the board because they are the fun group that, that we have to keep in check at times. So we appreciate all that they do. And, uh, and, and Megan alluded to this. Marcella Talamante left uh, extension, so we have one regional director from the West currently. And the, according to the bylaws, the board was able to make a motion to appoint a new regional director from the West. We reappointed Megan instead of training a new person. She'll continue to serve for one more year, so we appreciate Megan. She won't be the relations chair anymore, so we don't have to ha listen to her on stage, but we appreciate having her in the, meet in the board meetings as well. So as I was sitting here, I think about all the energy that was in this room when the band came in. You guys are just kind of, kind of quiet now, and I don't know what you're doing. You're watching your phones or whatever. I was in a session yesterday, and, and, and people asked me this morning how I was feeling. And I try not to use the word fine, because if, if you ever had any kids or people you've asked how your day at school was or how your day at work was, they say fine, right? So if you've ever seen the, the movie The Italian Job, at my house, the word fine means something else. My daughter has a 12-year-old, and they were headed to school the other day, and she said, Dad, will you tell Cody what fine means? So according to Charlie Theron from the movie Italian Job, fine means freaked out, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. That's how I felt this morning before I came to the stage, but I didn't share that. So, so just make sure that if, 
If you say the word fine, that's what it means, but try not to say the word fine, okay? I think now I get to introduce my, my friend Suzanne Bortz. I want to introduce, introduce Suzanne Bortz to the stage. She's a past president and the chair of the organization of stewardship, and she's also representing JSEP for our association day. So, Suzanne. Good morning, folks. I guess we need a little bit of an energizer. So if you were at the conference last year, I said to you, what is today? So what is today? Best day ever. I think it is the best day ever. And we have so much enthusiasm. I think we just all are sitting for a while and we think, oh, I have to stand up. So why don't you all stand up for a minute? Take a deep breath. Yesterday at our National Priority Day, we learned that we have to sometimes just focus and close our eyes and say, oh, we're here. It is the best day ever. So thank you. You can all sit down now if you'd like, or you can keep standing. <laughs> just a few moments ago, Megan referred to JSEP as being an opportunity that many of us attended and were able to get together and um, share ideas. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of JSEP. Yes, as a member of the National Association 4-H Youth Development Professionals, you are a member of JSEP, the Joint Council of Extension Professionals. The mission of JSEP is to elevate Extension's national reputation as an organization of excellence and synergistically leverage the strengths of member associations to foster leadership, collaboration, professional development, scholarly activity, strategic partnerships, and advocate for our profession. Two ways that we meet our mission is through two different conferences that are offered in the spring. The first one is the Extension Leadership Conference, or we refer to it as ELC. And the theme this year is to engage, inspire, and achieve, leading the way to a bright future. The ELC conference will take place February 7th through the 9th in Kansas City, Missouri. The second conference which you may be familiar with, is called PILD, which, re, which refers to Public Issues Leadership Development. And that conference is held in Arlington, Virginia, April 16th through the 19th. At this time, we are accepting proposals for both of these different conferences. So I really encourage you, this is an opportunity if you have an expertise in leadership, if you've been around for a while, if you're brand new and you've come across something that really highlights a great way to share leadership skills, please put in a proposal for one of these conferences so that we can come and visit with you at the JSEP or PILD Leadership Conference. If you want any more information, please visit us on jsep.org for more information and you will find um, any of the proposal information available there. Or you can always just find me and I'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you all and have a great day. I want to thank Suzanne for her continued service to the board and her, what she provides in leadership to JSIP as well. So today we're going to recognize our communicator award recipients, and tomorrow we'll recognize our specialty award recipients. And, and during the award celebration on Thursday, evening, we'll honor the service award winners. So I'd like to call Melissa Henry to the stage, the NA4HYDP Member Recognition Committee. She'll present the communicator award. So Melissa.
All right, good morning, everyone. I have admitted defeat and I have my little baby reader glasses on. Y'all, it is not fun being more seasoned. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Oh, thank you. Maybe I'm becoming spicy. I enjoy that comment. Thank you, RDs. I'm no longer seasoned. I'm now spicy. I appreciate that peanut gallery comment over there, too. Thank you. All right. If you are one of our national winners for our communication awards, if you'll please join us to my left over here. Come on down, friends. Mass media, social media, media presentations, oh my. Our Communicator Awards showcase the methods our 4-H professionals utilize to promote their events, provide education to their 4-H members and to the volunteers in their programs. This year there were close to 600 entries submitted from 35 states. Yeah, wow. <laughs> These awards are judged at the state level and then on to the regional level before reaching our national level. Before I present the national awards, I want to take just a moment to thank our state recognition chairs. If you are a state recognition chair, will you please stand? You don't understand how hard these folks work um, to get people to put their awards in the system. Sometimes the system doesn't like me and them both. And you guys do a great job promoting and encouraging on the state level. Uh, we also have regional recognition chairs. If you're one of our regional recognition chairs, past chair, chair elect who served this year, please stand as well. We have a great team and they do a great job recruiting folks to judge at that level. I want to say a special thanks to Fair Publishing House for sponsoring our awards. Uh, we do appreciate their continued support of our Communicator Awards program. For those of you interested in member recognition or just want to come hang out with us in the spicy community, um, uh, we do have our meeting. Um, I don't know if it's showing up in the app yet or not, but we are in the Hall of Fame room at 4 p.m. We'll talk a little recognition, but for those of you that have been state chairs before, you know we're going to sling a little plaques and sort those and get those ready for Thursday night. So that's on the second level, the Hall of Fame room. Thanks to all of you that attended our Small Bites breakfast this morning. That room was packed. I don't know if it was the free coffee or the free breakfast or just the chance to network with our award winners, but there was a lot of good conversation and discussion about awards and programs. So thanks to you. I know it's early, but thank you all for supporting our members um, with their award entries this morning. And now we are ready for our presentation. In the category of educational package by an individual, our winner from the Northeast region and the state of Pennsylvania is Sandy Graham. <laughs> For educational package by a team, and their title was Virtual Animal Crackers, All Creatures Big and Small, from the Northeast and New York, Sasha Diedrich, Jessica Tyson, Courtney Lavici, Jennifer Bassman, Debbie Grusenmeyer, Kyle Yacobucci, Brianna Hughes, Michael Fion Fiorentino, Aaron Humphrey, and Barb Jones. <laughs> and if all members of the team are here, they may come up. Educational piece by an individual. For their piece, Vaping, Small Devices, Big Impacts, from the North Central Region in North Dakota, Megan Hoffman. <laughs> Our educational piece by a team. For 4-H Clover Kids, Steaming Through the Seasons, from the North Central Region in Iowa, Nicole Hansen, Katie Peterson, Brenda Welch, Bonnie Dolliger, Shayla Lean, and Kayla Taylor. Our national winner in exhibit 
for the Geneva County 4-H National Peanut Festival booth from the southern region in Alabama, Madison Tew. Our national feature story winner, their story was called Wheelin' and Dealin', Buying Your New Ride, from the southern region in the state of Florida, Beth Kerr. And if someone's not here, if somebody from their state will, will gather their plaque at the end of our uh, general session. Our media presentation winner for their Monarchs and 4-H Monarchs presentation from the southern region in South Carolina, Mallory Mayer. Our national news story winner, prepare to launch Iowa 4-H to send fair foods into space. North Central Region in Iowa, Valen Bodensteiner. Our periodical publication by an individual, Cloverbud Connections, from the Western Region in Wyoming, Kimberly Fry. I love the paparazzi in the front. <laughs> Periodical publication by a team for the Friday 4-H Nugget from the North Central Region in Indiana, Robbie Kelly and Still Graybar. <laughs> Our national winner, winner in personal column from the Northeast Region in Pennsylvania, Sandy Graham. Promotional package by an individual, Bucks County 4-H introductory promotional materials from the Northeast Region, Pennsylvania, Sarah Gregory. Our promotional package by a team, I Belong, the Nebraska 4-H Month campaign from the North Central Region. Team members include Danielle DeWeese, Angela Apps, Amber Bowers, Beth Janning, Kate Marshall, J.C. Milius, Laura Narhes, Tessa Reese, Hannah Opfer, and Lindsay Shear from Nebraska. <laughs> Our promotional piece by an individual entitled Join 4-H from the North Central Region in Ohio, Alicia Foudy. Our promotional piece by a team, the 4-H Camp Abinaqua. Oh, got it. Flyer from the Northeast Region in Pennsylvania, Sarah Gregory and Tony Stutes. <laughs> Our published photo winner, their photo was called See Yourself in Ag Project Groups. From the Southern Region in Tennessee, Hunter Isbell. Our radio and audio program winner for their Youth and Ag podcast. From the North Central Region of Minnesota, Joe Rand, Allie Kleekner, Carrie Robidoux, and Samantha Lehman. <laughs> our next four categories were our new social media categories, and these were well received with over 100 entries for our social media, so I can tell that you guys really enjoyed us adding those. So for our social media package or campaign by an individual was called Get Your Piece of the 4-H Pie. North Central from Indiana, Kathleen Bodie. <laughs> our social media package campaign by a team forward together with Chris Clover from the North Central region in Wisconsin, Morgan Martinez, Sarah Waldron, Jennifer Svensson, Brianne Jacoby, and Evan Henthorn. Yeah. 
our social media piece by an individual for their centennial scavenger hunt from the southern region in Florida is Christy Popa. Our social media piece by a team is for their 4-H extension survey from the southern region in Tennessee was Danielle Pleasant, Sarah Ransom, and Billy Ward. And our national video program winner for Take 10 with 4-H from the western region in New Mexico is Cheryl Butterfield. Join me again in congratulating all of our national winners for their outstanding programs. Thank you, Melissa, and to the member recognition committee for doing all the great work they've done. I, I think it's awesome we can recognize our, our award winners, and thank you for all that you've done. Uh, congratulations once again to those award winners, and hopefully we'll have more applicants next year. At this time, I, I called the 2020 NA4HYDP business meeting in recess until 8.15 Central Time tomorrow morning. And before I invite Marie back to the stage, I need to recognize a person that's joined us in December. Shelly, Shelly, wake up back in the back. Shelly Blondis, she's our new executive director. At, at, and we couldn't do this without Shelly. She's joined us and she's learning by doing it the 4-H way, so we're glad to have Shelly with us this morning. So I'm now going to call Marie back to the stage to provide announcements. See, I told you he was my handler. He's going to make sure that I don't say anything off of these pieces of paper. Okay, the first one is the most fun, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time for maybe messing with the names, but it's the line of being called to the principal's office, so you're supposed to go to registration if I read your name. Caroline Homan, Kimberly Holmes, Sarah Gregory, Patricia McLaughlin, Catherine Sowell, Patricia Thompson, and Jana Lee Williams. Now on to the fun stuff, because you know I'm in charge of tonight. Oh, after the meeting, you don't have to go right now, sorry. <laughs> See, he's keeping me in line. Um, one of the community service events, um, in case you remembered to bring some socks for a collection, there's a yellow tub by the registration desk that will be there through tomorrow, so bring your socks. Um, you're supposed to remember that there are working group meetings at 4 o'clock today. If you're a first-timer conference goer, your participation is important. So please find your place and passion during these working groups. Don't forget to come tomorrow to Small Bites in the, for the specialty award winners and learn more about their programs. See, there's enthusiasm. And there's coffee. And I heard Megan say a couple of times, maybe we need more caffeine. The exhibit hall will be open on noon on Wednesday and posters from our colleagues will also be on display at that time. So the Creating a Healthier You Committee would like to remind everyone to download the conference app and participate in the Wellness Challenge. All those that participate will be entered in a drawing for some amazing gift cards that will be given away. So make sure you go to the Energizer tomorrow morning, 6.30 to 7.30 on the east rooftop. Speaking of rooftops, we have this awesome event tonight. I hope to see you all there. It's the opening event. We'd like to, you to join us on the rooftop for a Wisconsin tailgate party. Come in your comfortable clothes and be ready to play some yard games. And a couple of people always oh, really wanted a polka band. So there's a polka band. We'd also like you to bring cash for beverages. There's a cash bar. And we also, uh, okay, I'm going to just throw it out there because I heard from enough of you. Some people wanted Wisconsin cheese curds. So we're having a marketplace. You can buy the cheese curds. You just can't open them and eat them tomorrow. But you can take them home. So make sure you bring money to buy those as well. Food will start at 630. 
The easiest way that we have found to access the rooftop is if you go out of the Hilton and just go across that bridge, that's the easiest way to get there. So um, by the fountain is where the bands are gonna be. You'll hear the music. So head on over and dress comfortably. No need to enter into the terrace. You can go straight up there. There's a ramp that walks you right up there. And we hope you're gonna join us for that traditional tailgate with deep fried cheese curds and Babcock Hall ice cream. So make sure that you're there because it's coming right from campus. You. This right. is you, right? Yes. Perfect. All right, thank you, Marie. Uh, we started off script, so we're gonna continue that a little bit more as uh, we move ahead with our uh, keynote uh, speaker. Just wanted to share with, with everyone that over the last two years, we've taken a different approach with our keynote speakers and cap note speakers, and we've tried to find folks that know us, that are from us, there are people, and uh, we've been very, we've found another one. Uh, we are uh, very excited about this year's speaker, uh, Nikki Clifton. Um, and I don't want to steal too much of her thunder, but she is a 4-H alum. And um, one of the things that is really cool about Nikki this year is she, she has donated her honorarium to her home county 4-H program. And then, so, and, and then in addition to that, she's like, I really wanted to go to help kids go to camp. Uh, so, super cool. She knows us, and I wanted to share that with everyone. Um, and then also, uh, we'll do another reminder at the end, but we're sort of priming the pump here. Nikki would like to do Q&A at the end of her talk. So she'd like to, if you have questions about her story, if, uh, if you have questions about your story, but she is uh, willing. We now have mics on the mic stands, so you can actually ask those questions. Uh, so we'll do another reminder at the end uh, when Nikki uh, is done, but we know sometimes when we say, does anyone have any questions, the room goes silent and it's awkward. And so um, start thinking about questions that you have, uh, that you might have as Nikki is talking. Um, it also is my honor at this time so Aaron, you're still doing your thing. <laughs> so at this time, I would like to welcome a longtime sponsor that we have had, um, Aaron Bain from American Income Life Special Risk Division to officially introduce our keynote speaker. Good morning, y'all. How are you? Wake up a little bit. I'm going to keep it quick, I promise. I want Nikki to get up here and uh, share some great stuff with us. So good morning. Um, as Sean said, my name is Erin Bain. I am the director of the Special Risk Division of American Income Life. We are America's leading provider of uh, coverage for 4-H and extension programs. And I'm so glad to be joining you here in Madison as a sponsor and exhibitor. Um, this is my seventh annual conference with AIL, but my tenth overall, because for those of you that don't know, uh, prior to joining the Special Risk Division, I was a County 4-H educator and a 4-H camp program director and worked in the state 4-H of state office uh, between Virginia and North Carolina for over 10 years and grew up as a 4-H'er in Dinwiddie County, Virginia, which is about as big as it sounds. Um, <laughs> And 4-H truly, better or worse, made me the person that I am today. Um, and I know firsthand from a lot of different perspectives how much dedication truly goes into a career in 4-H and what you all have committed to uh, being a part of this work um, and continuing your professional development as a part of NAE 4-H YDP. I still have to convince my mouth to say it that way. Um, I cannot tell you how much it means to me to get to come to this event every year, both personally and professionally. I get to see folks that I have known and worked with, um, in some cases since I was uh, a kid in 4-H, Jeremy Johnson and I were camp counselors together a million and a half years ago, it feels like. Um, so being a part of 4-H of and contributing as a sponsor is really important to me, continuing to help ensure that your 4-H programs are safe and successful. Our motto is serving those who serve others. And we've been doing that since 1952 and hope to continue doing for many, many more years to come. Um, please come visit me in the exhibit hall. I do have highlighters. 
and other swag. So come visit me. Come get my stuff. I don't want to take it home with me. Um, and now I am glad to uh, officially introduce Nikki Clifton, our uh, speaker for today. If you look up Nikki's biography on UPS.com, you'll discover that she is the president of Social Impact and the UPS Foundation. And she's done some really impressive stuff. What you may not know is just like many of us, she got her start in 4-H. As a Clark County, Georgia 4-H'er, she participated in judging events and completed citizenship projects. Her 4-H agents shared that Nikki was in the extension office every week, ready to participate in whatever was on the agenda. She attended National 4-H Congress, was a member of Clovers and Company, and the nationally acclaimed Georgia Performing Arts Troupe. Nikki's mom, Pat, said, 4-H gave Nikki many ways to win, but it also taught her how to lose with grace. Bo Riles, her former 4-H agent, said, Nikki raised the bar for all those around her because she was always prepared and approached any project ready to lead. The lives she has touched and the positive difference she has made is inspiring. Please help me welcome a fellow 4-H alumna, Nikki Clifton. Thank you so much, Erin, and good morning, everybody. Erin, I just want to thank you again for being a sponsor. I know how important it is to have people behind you supporting these events, and as you were talking, Bo said that your company basically insured every single event um, and was right behind 4-H, and so I want to say thank you again, and thank you for the warm introduction. Good morning, everybody. All right, you know, it's not every day that you've got a marching band that's the lead in. So um, I understand that um, we all should be awake and ready to, 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 um, to hear the speech and to, to talk about the impact that 4-H has made um, on my life. I just really want to thank Bo Riles for inviting me this morning. It's just great to be here with all of you. And it's an honor to see all of you and to be able to acknowledge the difference that you're making as professionals who are tirelessly promoting, strengthening, and advocating for our young people every day. You know, I think I can um, honestly say that we've all faced really profound, difficult challenges in the last couple of years. We've had a global pandemic. We've had social unrest. We're in the midst of a lot of geopolitical instability, and we are tired, right? We're tired. And sometimes we have to know that when we're working with young people, it's okay to admit that we're tired too. We're struggling. We're trying to regain our footing. We're trying to find our resilience. But I know that one thing for certain has never wavered over the past three years, and that is your dedication, your commitment, and your responsibility to following through on 4-H's mission to give all young people access to opportunity. Talent is everywhere. Can we agree on that? Opportunity is not. Everyone in this room plays a critical role in developing our nation's youth and in helping them to achieve their goals and their dreams. And I can't think of a time more critical for people to be invested and dedicated in our youth than right now. When our nation's youth achieves greatness, when our nation's youth achieves their outcomes, that creates real positive change for the world. And so by being at the heart of creating pathways to empower these young individuals, by being in, uh, invested in their success and by nurturing our next generation of leaders, you are cultivating success for all of us. So thank you. Like Erin said, I am a proud Georgia 4-H alumna. I am also the president of the UPS Foundation. And many of you probably didn't know that those brown trucks that roll down your streets every day are also deeply invested in the community. UPS is a 115-year-old company. But 70 years ago, the foundation was formed. And I'm really proud to lead our organization and our mission to create a more equitable and just world. At UPS, we have an extraordinary purpose statement, moving our world forward 
by delivering what matters. And so you can imagine how excited I was to find out that your conference theme this year was Forward Together because it very much mirrors our UPS purpose and it's a true testament to how two organizations can really bring value to communities. I also love that UPS and 4-H lead very similarly in terms of our organizational alignment. So get this, 4-H of course has the head, heart, hands, and health motto. Last year, UPS came up with our new leadership structure, which focuses on developing holistic, authentic leaders who are business-minded, agile, and future forward. And you know what it was called? The head, heart, hands leadership model. Right. I was like, did anybody talk to 4-H about this? Oh my goodness, what in the world? So, you know, the lawyer in me was kind of looking to make sure that we were good from a, <laughs> you know, but since we left off health, I think we're okay. So I've always considered myself a 4 h -er for life, and this organization taught me so much and laid the foundation for what has really become an incredibly fulfilling career. When I was thinking about what I might share with you all today, a lot of things came to mind, but I really want to focus on three main points. I want to begin by giving a shout out to my extension agents, Marilyn Poole and Bo Riles. And if you can believe it, Bo was sitting right there texting Marilyn before I stepped up on this stage, and within five minutes, she answered. I also have some fellow Clark County 4-Hers in here, Jenny, I always call her Jenny War, Jenny Jordan, and Casey Mall. Where are y'all? They're somewhere in here. Okay, there they are. So, you know, we roll as a pack. Even after all these years, Georgia 4 H is always in the house. I, I was a fourth grader in Athens, Georgia, when I met Marilyn Poole and Bo Riles. Fourth grade. Can you imagine the impressionable young girl growing up in a big college town? And, you know, if it weren't for extension agents just like Marilyn and Bo, who invested so much in me, so much time and energy and support, I would not be here today. Bo and Marilyn played a key role in teaching me three lessons that I want to share with you today. Number one, learn to navigate any social setting to build strong relationships. Number two, know and stay true to your priorities. And number three, wisely choose who is in your corner? I'm so glad to have learned these lessons early on because I needed every single one of them throughout my career and even in my personal life. So the first lesson, learn to navigate any social setting to cultivate a strong relationship. Now, as you can imagine, walking into a big room like this and networking didn't come naturally to my fourth grade self. And it does help when you got a band. That's not a bad deal. I highly recommend that. But walking into a room full of people and networking is something I have to do every day, leading a, a, the UPS Foundation, who is serving in 220 different countries around the globe. So you might be surprised that I learned that skill in 4-H, in the fourth grade, with my first county project, landscape design. I had no business in landscape design. <laughs> but it seemed exciting. And when Miss Poole came into our fourth grade class and talked about all the things that we could do, understanding about shrubs and liriope, which some people call liriope in the South, um, seemed exciting. I then moved on to poultry judging. <laughs> I learned all about the white leghorn production hens and how to judge eggs. But what I also learned was how to stand up and make an argument, how to organize my thoughts, how to be persuasive, how to deal with live birds that were pecking at you. And that's also really career and skill building, right? Because <laughs> So looking back, I learned that the fundamentals of cultivating relationships, how to stand up straight, how to be on time, shaking hands, looking people in the eyes, and developing connectivity with people who really may not have anything in common with you, those are fundamental skills that 4-H has taught me. 
Now, I know that the world is quickly changing. My husband and I have four kids between us, four teenagers, so y'all pray for me. They serve as constant reminders every day that things are not the same as they were back in my day. But I want to encourage each of you who are working with young kids like my, 4-H, my, my four, uh, fourth grade self to keep instilling those everyday old school soft skills because they come in handy. They are game changers. As a young girl, as a high schooler, and now as a person who makes career decisions and offers jobs to kids every day, I look for those soft skills. I look for those professional elements that were rooted in 4-H. So know and understand how to cultivate social settings and cultivate relationships. The second lesson is know and stay true to your priorities. 4-H helped me understand and declare what was most important to me, and that is rooted in my faith. When your personal and professional priorities are in sync, that's what I like to call creating your dream job. I always say that my day job is my dream job because I've understood how to create passion at work. 4-H's mission is also to create young opportunity for young people. And that's a priority that I wholeheartedly stand behind because it's my personal belief that we have an obligation to build the best in young people and to empower the next generation of diverse leaders. This priority also aligns with one of the UPS Foundation's core strategic goals to create economic empowerment and opportunity for underserved, underrepresented women, minorities, and marginalized communities. So let's unpack that a little bit. Equity and economic opportunity, those are key enablers of chance, of opportunity for young people. And that's what all of us in this room have committed to, giving young people an opportunity and a leg up for the next generation. So as extension agents, I'm sure there are times when some of you worry about whether your kids' priorities are aligned. You're pouring so much into them day to day, and there's lots of distractions that come their way, right? And so I just wanna share with you a little bit of a story, you know, to underscore the point that you should never underestimate the power of your ability to influence kids to stay focused on their dreams. The story goes like this. After dabbling a little bit in poultry judging and public speaking, I decided that I really wanted to focus on being a master public speaking 4 her And things were going great as long as I was winning. <laughs> but then I got older and I started competing at a higher level at district competitions. And for a while, things weren't going so well. The competition started getting, getting stiffer. The blue ribbons turned to red, and then they turned to those green. And then I started hearing, everybody's a winner just for being here. <laughs> I know y'all have said it, because I've said it myself. But in high school, I wanted to win. I wanted to achieve. And after I lost a big district competition, and Jenny might remember this, I said, I'm gonna quit. I'm done with 4-H. I'm out of here. I wanna be a cheerleader. I've got other priorities. My mother looked at me and said, I can't stop you from quitting, but you have to go tell Marilyn Poole and Bo Riles. Y'all know that was a non-starter. <laughs> the thought of disappointing the 4-H agents that had poured their life's work into me and so many young kids just like me, I just couldn't do it. And so what happened? I went back home, started working on my speech, reworked it, polished up my record book, started practicing in the mirror and realized that failure doesn't define you and that sometimes you gotta get back on the horse. And that year, I won the national 4-H competition at the national level and became a presidential tray winner. Thank you. 
So my takeaway for you is to be the leader that inspires those young kids to keep going. Be the person that they don't want to disappoint. I know each of you have that within you and never forget that you are the light that's shining within kids every day, even when it feels thankless and even when it feels like they're not listening and you're having to drag them up the hill, they're watching you, they need you, and they do appreciate you. So the last big lesson I learned from 4-H that I wanna share with you is to ensure that you've got the right people in your corner. And when I say the right people, I'm talking about folks that will bang the marching band for you, that will come in and wear a t-shirt with your face on it even when you're not in the room. I always say that it's not what you know, it's who you know and what they're willing to say about you. 4-H leaders have made up a big part of this group for me. In good times and tough times, they've been right there cheering me on and encouraging me. They've told me when I needed to work harder and they've given me grace when I needed to cut myself some slack. And I wanna share that that's an important message today, particularly when our youth are bombarded by social media and they feel judged at every corner. Sometimes it's okay to tell them to give themselves some grace. Our kids right now are struggling to judge themselves by a standard that is often manufactured for likes and for followers. And that is not real leadership. So we want to develop leaders. And sometimes those leaders need the right people in their corner, people who will push them to do better, who will tell them when they're making mistakes, and who will be their cheerleaders when they need them. I've always said that it's important to surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and who have your back. And the best part is that message lets people understand that when you fail, it's okay. Success is failure turned inside out. And so be that champion for the kids that you're nurturing every day because that's when extraordinary things happen. So like I said, I started 4-H when I was in the fourth grade and now I'm leading an international team that's creating the positive, meaningful change that we want to see in the world. We're bringing vaccines to parts of Africa via drone. We are helping people in the midst of Hurricane Fiona and helping people in the midst of Hurricane Ian. We've delivered more than $2 million worth of resources to folks in the Ukraine. And I credit so much of my success to people like you, people like Bo people like Marilyn Poole, who pushed me and saw something in myself that I didn't see. From poultry judging, to Clovers and Company, to being a master 4-H'er and a presidential tray winner, 4-H has given me opportunities that I never expected. And that's how 4-H has now brought me to this full circle moment here with all of you. These lessons I know are not unique to my 4-H experience learning to navigate your own social settings, building strong relationships and staying true to your priorities and wisely choosing who's in your corner. Those are messages that we can bring back to every child we touch every single day. Because of you, I know that our youth will have the tools that they need to be unstoppable. And that's what I and 500,000 UPSers around the globe call delivering what matters. Thank you so much for the opportunity to address you all today. Thank you for the difference that you're making in our kids' lives, and thank you for the difference that 4-H has made in my life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -oh. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, uh, so much for those words uh, about the importance of the work that we do. Um, and so uh, we'll see if there are any, there any questions. Uh, any questions? <laughs> you all had a warning. You cannot ask, where is my package? <laughs> <laughs> See me outside. <laughs> oh, good. Okay. So you mentioned that um, y'all had a foundation. You touched on a couple of things mm -hmm. that y'all, um, you know, fund and yes. do. But can you tell us a little bit more about what the mission of the foundation 
Sure, yeah, sure. So we've been around for 70 years, and the mission under, of the foundation under my new leadership is centered in equity and justice. And we've got four focus areas, health and humanitarian relief. Part of that is vaccine equity, bringing vaccines to underserved parts of the country, and then humanitarian relief. So exactly what we're doing right now to work with like the Red Cross and to work with the Salvation Army to bring humanitarian relief services to people in need after the hurricanes. Um, we also have equity and economic empowerment, and that's about inspiring and empowering underserved women to scale their businesses, because we know when we can build up women, they build up the entire community. And so we're investing in women globally to try to help them scale their businesses and understand about customs and to bring international support to women globally. We also support youth organizations to help empower um, young people from a leadership development standpoint. And that's something that I am very, very in, in, uh, invested in. Um, the four, third part of our, our focus area is local community engagement. UPSers, we've got 500,000 UPSers around the globe. And so volunteering is a big part of our focus. We've made a commitment to deliver 30 million volunteer hours by 2030. And we are on the way to doing that. And then the last part of our focus area is planet protection because we're an airline and we drive a lot of trucks and, and create our share of carbon. So under our planet protection portfolio, we're committed to planting 50 million trees by 2030. And so that's what we call the help focus area. Each of those, um, uh, those, those focus areas um, spell out the word help. And, and so we're really committed to making sure that we advance sustainability and an equitable and just world. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. If you have a question, uh, if you could go to one of the three mics. Um, there's one over here by Lisa, I see, <laughs> if you can raise, raise your hand. And uh, there's one over, wave over by that mic. And then we have one right here by Chad. Um, and one right there in the front. So you can talk so that in the mic so that the folks in the back and around the room can hear. Thanks. So mine's kind of a follow-up to Janine's. Yeah. Um, so how, if we wanted to locally engage with UPS in our areas, what would be the best way to do that? The best way to do that is to connect with UPSers locally to come and volunteer. And that helps get you on the radar so that we can start understanding what your priorities are in the local community. And then that helps you be eligible for, for grants from the foundation. We typically are an unsolicited grant um, uh, foundation process. And so the best way is if you know a UPSer to talk to them about how to come and volunteer. And I will say this, I would, I would be remiss if I did not give a shout out to our company right now who is trying to hire 100,000 people for peak season. So if any of you need a job, if any of you know someone who needs a job, come and join UPS from October to January when we are delivering packages. And I actually drove for three months in Columbia, Maryland. And you know why? Because I knew how to drive big heavy equipment and, and drive a stick. And, and so I drove a UPS package truck for three months, and I, I think it's some of the most humbling work I've ever done. Um, it's hard work, but our folks are out there every day delivering for y'all. We never closed during the pandemic, and I want to thank all of you who are our customers. And, and if you know anybody, we start hiring at 18 years old. So tell them upsjobs.com. <laughs> Hi, Nikki. Hi. Is it on? Uh, first of all, please don't steal any of our employees. We need every <laughs> single person in this room. And just uh, for the record, I'm from uh, uh, New Jersey, from Rutgers University. We're also hiring. So, uh, <laughs> but no, I thank you so much for sharing your story. It was so um, it was heartwarming, and I think it's so interesting to sort of see from your perspective. I mean, clearly you understand how 4-H impacted your life, yes. um, and in your current role. You have such a global view of how um, companies are supporting efforts like in youth development far beyond 4-H, but 4-H included. I was just wondering if you could share from um, your unique perspective what we could be doing as an organization to better position ourselves to work in partnership with foundations like yours. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think sometimes folks just don't know that companies really are invested in their communities. 
And so doing the research to find out what companies in your areas care about, um, a lot of companies really are focused right now on a workforce development pipeline, right? We need workers and we need workers who come career and skill ready. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a college degree, right? And that's one of the things that we're trying to make sure that we invest in with kids to understand you may go to college, but you might not. And there's still these fundamental skills that you have to have, right? And so I think understanding what companies are looking for, whether it's in STEM, I love that 4-H is really ramping up the STEM education because UPS is a company that's really powered by code. You know, we are, we're an engineering company. Um, and so knowing what those skills are, it's really important so that you can tell the story of how your organization helps get, get, get children ready. The other piece I will say is don't uh, underestimate the power of internships. Um, we've got intern programs. Ask the local companies whether or not you can partner with them to get the kids in the door. I did an internship when I was young. Um, it was invaluable to me. And so I think don't forget that companies are looking for workers and, and, and young people who can start early, who want to soak up things. And I've never seen a more prepared group of people than 4-Hers right? They know exactly what to do and they know how to be ready. So those are a couple of ways that I can think about that you can connect with companies to, to make sure that you're aligning. You're welcome. Hey. Good morning, Nikki. Good morning. My name is Jeffrey Burke. I'm a fellow uh, Georgia 4-H alumni. All right. And live in Athens, Georgia and work on campus at the University of Georgia in organizational else? development and extension. And my question is, will you be in my corner? Absolutely. Oh my God. You see how that's done? Don't, that's what I call don't ask, don't get. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. I am, I am thrilled to support Georgia 4-H and support my hometown. And um, I just, like I said, I wouldn't be standing here without the wonderful support of 4-Hers. And everywhere that I go, I think about the, the skills and the opportunities that 4-H gave me. So thank you all for what you do every day. Keep inspiring our young people. Continue to do what you're doing. Don't give up and know how much we appreciate everything that you're doing. Thanks so much. Oh, I didn't see it. I'm sorry, I didn't, I looked this way. Hey, how are you? Hello, Nikki. Thank you for your presentation this morning. Okay. I'm intrigued with your first criteria that Georgia 4-H helped you to acquire. You said that it taught you how to navigate in any corner. Mm -hmm. We have a goal to reach more and more diverse young people. Can you elaborate on the skill set that you acquired that taught you how to navigate? Because I just don't think that it's all about education. I think that there are other skills that you probably acquired, and I would like to hear your opinion on that. Sure. So thanks for that question. Um, you know, when I think about diversity, and I think about the importance of being able to walk into a room and stand up straight and have confidence with people who don't necessarily look like you. What I think about is a sense of belonging and a sense of understanding that if you can teach a child that they belong, okay, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their sexual orientation or identity, regardless of their economic background. If you can instill in a child that they belong, that is everything. And I don't, I don't remember, I don't remember Bo or Marilyn using those words with me. It was how I was treated, okay? It was how I was treated. And I think some of that is in the time that people spend with you. It's the words of encouragement, but it's also making people feel like they're your family. Even if you don't share your common interest necessarily, it's all about how leaders invest in you and invested in me. And so there's not a silver bullet for diversity. In fact, it'd be great if we could strip the label of diversity off and think about how to treat people as human beings. Treat people with kindness. Um, I'm so glad you asked that question because, you know, I, I work in a global environment and the issues of diversity in Canada 
are different than they are in um, Georgia. They're different than they are in Dubai. I've got a global team. And so when we talk about issues of race or issues of gender equality, sometimes folks are like, what are y'all talking about? We don't have these issues here. And I think it boils down to treating people as humans and giving folks the confidence that no matter who they are, they are valued, they're respected. And that's in the way that you interact. That's in the warm embrace that you give people. It's in, you know, this morning someone came up to me and said, your necklace is hooked around your 4-H clover. You need to move your necklace over here, right? It's those little things where people see you and they help instill that encouragement. And so I would just encourage all of you to think less about labels, to think more about humanity. Think less about labels and think more about humanities. We all bleed the same blood. And so when I figured out that I was just as valuable as anybody else walking in the room, it gave me the confidence that I have today and that's what I'd like for all of you to think about when you're interacting with our children, because they need that more and more. The world is global, and we are all one world. And so thank you for asking that question. I really appreciate it. Anybody else? I do have a question, but that was so lovely. I feel like that's such a great way to close. So. <laughs> It's up to you if you want another question or not. <laughs> Please, go ahead. OK. Um, well, thank you so much for your story and your service. Uh, I'm a new hire and uh, the Ashland County educator up north in Wisconsin, so I'm very excited to Congratulations. Get thank you. Um, and so I, I wanted to touch a little bit on that global perspective that you have, because I am curious. You still work with youth members, correct? Like. I do. Yeah. yeah so do. I'm so curious what you see from their perspective or what they talk about their needs are personally or collectively um, and how that might enlighten us to certain things that we could maybe tie into our local, rural, urban, what, whatnot uh, yeah. activities. You know, it's interesting, and I, I'm, I'm going to speak as a mom now, um, and, and, and from all the kids that, that, I, that I have the opportunity to work with through, through the UPS Foundation. Number one, I think kids want to be heard. They want you to listen. They don't necessarily want you to solve their problems, okay? I'm a lawyer, I'm a fixer, I'm all about getting it done. And sometimes the kids don't want you to solve their problem, they just want you to listen. And sometimes what they're saying doesn't necessarily make sense to our adult brains, right? <laughs> But it makes sense in their mind. And a lot of times they just want you to hear them out. They want you to understand that they're connected to their phones. It's like an appendage. They're digital natives. It drives me crazy that my kids can't put the phone down, okay? But that's the world they grew up in. And so we've got to figure out how to meet kids where they are and accept them for who they are. I also see that a lot of kids are not concerned about labels. My kids are not concerned about um, showing up in a certain skin. They're not concerned about, my, my daughter is always talking about who is gender fluid, who is this, who is that. They speak with a language of acceptance that I find so courageous, so courageous. And that's what I loved about 4-H is because it was a place that everybody could belong, right? And I think we need to continue fostering that, and some of that is the listening piece, but some of that's realizing these kids aren't worrying about the labels. They want to change the world, and they want to know that they're going to leave the world better than they found it. They, ought, they, ought, they are also fearless, right? They're fearless. And as I tell my son all the time, I can see farther than you can. I need you to slow down. But they don't want to slow down. They want to go fast. And so I think we have to figure out how to adjust. We've got to meet them where they are, whether it's digitally or, or offer them opportunities to put the phone down so we can just listen and connect. The kids also want to have fun, right? They, they want to have fun. These last three years of COVID have been extremely stressful. Yesterday was World Mental Health Day, right? And it's so important to acknowledge that a lot of the kids that you're working with, you are their escape. 
okay? You're their escape from a world that a lot of us don't ever have to face. And so I think just taking the time to ask kids, what's on your mind? How can I help you? And then listen to what they have to say is the best thing that we can do in this moment. We're navigating uncharted times. None of us really know what we're doing. We're making it up as we go along. But when you start with kindness, when you think about meeting people where they are, and when you understand that fundamentally we're all human, I think that's the best we can do. Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you again, Nikki, for your spending your time and uh, telling your Thank story you. and Thank the impact so that the 4-H program had on you. Thank so. you. Thank you. Thank you all. And there's a bit of a break uh, before the, the first session starts, the first workshop uh, session starts. So uh, enjoy getting a look around uh, the Monona uh, Terrace uh, and the beautiful waterfront out here. <laughs>